Jesus has always been a part of my life. I had a grandfather and a father who were both pastors, but it had not really be a true part of it. Everything I knew about Jesus came from stories I heard as a kid growing up, but as I grew into adulthood, there was nothing about my life that said I was a Christian. I grew up in a Christian household, um, but I was living a double life. I would be at church one week, but then I would go out and do anything I wanted to do in the world. Things got so bad that I could not believe that God was good. I prayed, if you are real, I need you to do something, please. The moment I fully, truly accepted him, I was in one of the church services, and I was hearing about the goodness and greatness of God. Hey, maybe I should really do this thing for real. I was at a church retreat in Wisconsin. I actually encountered Jesus. He completely um, gave me a 180 mindset. Now, I realized that I had been replacing him with a counterfeit uh, God that wasn't real, and ever since then, I've been living for him. And as I sat there, I started to feel hope rising up inside of me. I actually started to see some of the ways that God had actually been coming through for me. All I could say was, forgive me for doubting you, forgive me for blaming you. That moment ended up being the most pivotal time in my entire walk with Christ. I walked out of there full of gratitude for God's goodness. After I fully uh, gave my life to Christ, people started coming, hey, can you pray for me about this? And I was like, oh, you know it's just me, the regular Brian, it's just, the, it's like, no nah, man, it's something different. My life has completely changed. Um, I'm now seeing the purpose that God put me on this earth for, and I realized that life has way more meaning to it than I ever thought it did. I went from just hearing stories, knowing stories about who Jesus is, to really experiencing who Jesus is, and I have never been the same since that day. It was the best decision I ever made. Come and see the man who has changed my life. Come on, how cool was that? Good morning, Calvary Church. Who's glad to be in God's house today? Come on, let's give God a big praise for being in this place this morning. It's so good to see you guys. Think about this real fast. You're walking in such despair and difficulty. You're 19 years of age, and you're crossing over one of the most beautiful bridges in the United States, the Golden Gate Bridge. And you're weeping, and you're crying, and you're, you're telling yourself life is not worth living. I, I just need to end this now. But you're saying to yourself, if just one person will simply ask me what's wrong, just one person will say, why are you weeping? You're, you're such a young person. Why, what's so distressing that you're just walking in this Golden Gate Bridge and you're suffering and your face is showing the, the difficulty? Just one person would simply say, hey, why you got tears? And nobody does. Nobody says anything. And so at 19 years of age, you go to the side of the bridge and just begin to throw yourself off the bridge with the sense that this is all there is. I may as well give up my life. Yet the moment your feet leave the bridge, your first prayer is, God, I don't want to die. You know that death is imminent because that's why you came that day. It was to end it all. Your name is Kevin. You're 19 years of age, early, early, 20, or early 2000s. And you're walking across this place with the hope someone will stop you. Nobody does. You jump off and realize, I don't want to end it. And the first thing you cry out then and there is, God, I don't want to die. Had he said that on the bridge, he may not have jumped in the first place. Had someone said hello or what's going on, he may have stopped his trajectory. And the stories told time and again throughout the next 20 plus years of his attempted suicide, his name was Kevin, his attempt to end it all, yet what's unique to me about this is the first thing he said upon leaving the side of the bridge was, God, I don't want to die. Something inside of him said, call out to God. That's the nature built inside of all of us. We understand even by default that there is something bigger, larger, stronger than us. That, of course, that something is a divine being, the creator of all things, God Almighty, the God of Israel. There is a true and living God today. And this God came in this person's heart in that conversation. He just kind of dropped in to cry out to me. Maybe today you're in a place of despair and difficulty. So you have to ask the question. You have to ask the question. This person survived the attempted suicide. It's a few, few do when they jump from the Golden Gate Bridge, but he did. And the stories told that while he was bobbing in the water praying, I don't want to die, he was broken by the fall. Literally a sea lion began to bump underneath him and push him toward the surface. Kept him afloat till they could get and rescue the young man. 
And he began to go on, tell a story about mental health and wellness and such an important conversation for us today but to realize that we definitely live in times of spiritual attack on our minds. 100% happening right now. Even in this room, maybe today you came in with some spiritual weight in your mind. And maybe that despair begins to mount, which brings us to the question, what is our hope? What is our only hope? In fact, here's a quick little two-minute theology for you. Our only hope in life and in death is that we are not our own, but we belong, body, soul, both in life and in death, to God our creator and to our savior, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 14, verse seven and eight says, for none of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself, for if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. You're not your own. There's someone that fashioned you, someone that made you. God Almighty placed you here. Your parents, yes, were the carriers of the process of human formation, but you're here because God himself literally from your inception placed you here. An eternal God, a God who's a good God, we are God's, therefore, and let us live our life every day according to God's plan, his will for us as our creator. God gave dominion to the earth, to mankind and creation. But our dominion was a service designed to serve and worship him and his kingdom and not ourselves. The gift that we were given to take authority over this earth was not to be self-serving, not to control each other, but to glorify God. Sadly, our continued pursuits as human beings on a regular basis to engage in temporary pleasure in exchange for eternal hope, our, 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 our sense of self and self-centeredness that places us at the center of all things, that we think will bring joy, has actually brought great sorrow. When had we lived to glorify him, we would have seen great joy. My prayer for us today is that we can all live to serve our creator. Live to serve the one that fashioned and formed you. John chapter 3, 16, if you've ever seen this, maybe at a football game or a baseball game, the banner, John 3, 16, right by the goalpost, here's the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We were built to live eternally. We weren't created to die, we were created to live eternally. We have an eternal part within our being even right now. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him, his son Jesus. Then it says, whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's only son. This is the verdict. In other words, here's the story. Light has come into the world. Jesus Christ is that light. Light illuminates. Light is truth. It's come in the world today. It's here right now. Jesus is here by his spirit and by his church. But the difficulty is this. The people love darkness instead of light because our deeds are evil. Now here we find in John three sixteen this idea that our hope, our hope with God is not just in our creation, but the person of Jesus Christ, his son, living a sinless life upon the earth. Jesus, of course, is a name we can often use, too often maybe in vain, but we know the name of Jesus. We know to call upon this name. Of course, he was the only begotten son of the father, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life upon this earth, submitted himself to the father to obedience, even to the cross, dying between two thieves, resurrected from the dead as prophesied by the prophets, conquering both death, hell, and the grave, and giving us eternal hope. He then ascends into the heavens, and he promises one day to come back and receive us to himself. This is not the end of the story. Yes, Jesus died, but that's not the end. We call this the gospel. The good news about Jesus Christ is the gospel. Romans chapter 1, 16, the apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto what? Salvation. And then it says salvation for who? Who, who qualifies for salvation? Is it a, a certain type of person, a certain economic status? Is it, is it men? Is it women? Is it American? Is it African? Who does, it, who, does, who does this apply to? And the Bible says right here, 
everyone who believes. How many are part of the everyone category today? You're included in the everyone conversation. Yes, everyone. It doesn't matter whether it be Jew or Gentile, but when we see this text in verse 17, it says, for the gospel, the righteousness of God's revealed and the righteousness that is faith from first to last, just as it's written, the just shall live by faith. So we see a parallel here to not just believing, but a different way of living. Following Jesus is not just a belief that we just proclaim internally. It's a lifestyle that you live out every day. It's, it's a commitment that you make with your life. And maybe today you're in the house and maybe today you're already lined up with all this or maybe today you're not there. So maybe if you're already there, this for you is a great study in how to help somebody else find this faith in Jesus Christ. Or for somebody else today, maybe this is your day to turn your life toward Jesus. See, the gospel, like any other form of organized thought about faith, exists around the person of Jesus Christ. And when you bring this up, it brings in questions that relate to today and also to eternal life. What's the big idea? What's it matter now? What's it matter then? Many people love the idea of the eternal hope of Jesus Christ. I mean, who doesn't want to have fire insurance? I mean, who, who doesn't want to miss hell? But the challenge that comes in is this whole, well, what do you mean i got to live differently? I, I've got to do something with my life that's different. I, I kind of like having charge over myself, and this is the problem with humanity. See, when God made humanity, he made us with the intention that they, we could live under his righteous laws. We would have perfect joy. We would obey him without any problem. Obedience to God would not have been an issue for us because we would have seen the idea that he wants to be in fellowship with us. We would have had unbroken fellowship and live our lives in a wonderful place. But that's not where we are. Fellowship was broken by a thing called sin. We we humans, and again, I know you're thinking, well, that was them, not me. We're covered by what they did because of the sin nature now resides in every heart. As we saw in the previous conversation with the young man, we were, we, we were weighed down by life way too often. We, we talk about ending our journey because there's too much going on, yet the fellowship God had intended for us would have placed all of us in a place of perpetual joy, perpetual peace and harmony with our creator and what's interesting to me is that God, when he made mankind, he gave us work to do. He said, be fruitful, multiply, take authority over this earth and enjoy all of it. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, he said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and everything that moves upon the earth. He said, guys, I've made this for you. Go and enjoy it and experience it, and love it, because this is yours. But that wasn't enough for us, because we believed a lie that said, oh, he probably has shortchanged you. Satan always wants you to think that if you try to follow God, he'll shortchange you. You'll, you'll have this sense that if I turn my heart to Jesus today, and if I commit to this new life, I'm going to miss out on something. I'm going to miss out on all the, the fun. Fun? Fun is joy. Fun is peace. Fun is enjoying that you have eternal hope. Fun is knowing your sins are washed away, your past is forgiven, and you have a promise of a place called heaven. That sounds a whole lot of fun to me today. So when you look at this, in fact, if we realize the picture of humanity that takes place in Genesis chapter 3, everything was going just fine. And then they caved to temptation. Temptation against the authority of God in their life, and they chose to disobey God and dishonor God by believing the lies. In fact, I've found in my journey that most folks that don't believe in God, they're not sure why they don't believe in God. They just have something they've been told one day, and now they disbelieve. They never actually vetted it out or looked into it. They never actually discovered it or pushed into the conversation. They just have simply chosen to say, well, that just doesn't work. Well, there's a lot of things, I don't know how they work, but they do work. And I don't know everything about God, but I believe in God because believing is not the same as knowing everything. That's called a know-it-all. If you're married, you've already given into the idea that you don't know all that you think you know about your spouse, but you believe that they're still there and they love you. Can I get an amen this morning? You believe they're still there. 
And you're still learning every step of the way. Genesis chapter 3 kind of paints this picture for us. Go real fast there to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? He begins to question God's word. You must not eat of the tree in the garden, he said. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit of the trees in the garden, but God, but God did say you must not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Then he said, you will not certainly die. He questioned the whole idea of death, the serpent said the woman, for God knows, for God knows that when you eat from the tree, your eyes will be opened. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God's holding this back from you because he wants to keep you beneath him. And he wants to lord over you. And so if you do this, he knows that you'll be equal to him. And that was the cry that scratched the itch in their heart that day. Let's be like God. When the woman saw the fruit was tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable to gain wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She gave it to her husband with her. And he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they were realized they were naked, so their present state had now become obvious to them. So they put fig leaves together, and they made coverings. And here we have our first ever swimsuit. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of God as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. This was an everyday thing, by the way. They hear him coming in for the next daily walk. And they hid from God. In other words, they had once walked with God. Now they're hiding from God. What happened? Sin had separated them and their creator. But the Lord God called the man. He said, where are you? Notice what's happening here. They're hiding God's calling. You can hide from God your whole life. God will still call for you. In fact, I love when people say, I found God. I want to go, no, God found you. God's looking for you. Now, you may have just realized that he's looking for you, but today we're here not because we found him, but because he found us. He took the initiative in the pursuit of relationship. And I thank God that every day God is still looking for someone to bring back into the family of God. That's the kind of God that we serve today. Mankind who had once walked with God was now hiding from God. The paradise that they had been given to govern had now turned toward decay, brokenness, Death was present because the curse was sin. The fall was not just upon them, but the fall was upon all of us. The Bible says that Adam and Eve were guilty, no doubt, but so are we because of our nature. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, if you look back a few paragraphs earlier in Romans chapter 3, the Bible says, none is righteous, no, not one. And this is a hard conversation. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is full of plenty of stumbling blocks. There's plenty of things about God that make people get tripped up. And this is definitely one of them. When you look at someone and say, hey, without God and Jesus in your life, you're a sinner in need of a Savior, they want to look back and push back and go, no, but I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. What do you mean call me a sinner? I, I, I'm, I'm good to my neighbors. I pay my bills. I cut my own grass. What do you mean I'm a sinner? We tend to think of sin as being some type of a social conversation when the truth is sin is rebellion against God's plan and God's will for your life. That is what sin is. We tend to minimize sin and reduce it down to something that's almost like a relational fight between two kids. Sin is much deeper than that, and we have to accept the depth of sin to understand the depth of our need for a Savior. If we look at sin casually and we look at sin like spilling the milk, then we will look for a Savior who would just wipe up the milk we just spilled. We needed someone to give their life because our sin was such a trespass against God. Jesus had to pay the price by giving the entirety of his life, not just clean up the spilled milk. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for me and for you because that's what sin really requires. Sin is not just a difficult day. Sin is not just, oh, I forgot to turn in my homework or I forgot to close the garage door. Sin is not just me and my spouse had a little spat today about a difficult conversation. Or sin is not just, I don't like my parents anymore because they don't understand me. That's not what sin is. Sin is literally an affront to a holy and a righteous God. And anywhere we don't line up with God's plan, that's what the Bible calls sin. 
And we see this sin come in early on in Genesis chapter 3, and it carries throughout the entirety of the Scripture. And what you also see is in Genesis chapter 3, not just that man sinned, but right then and there, God made a plan to redeem mankind back to himself. We serve a redemptive God today who's looking for you, who's calling for you, who loves you just as you are. And from the beginning when sin came in, so did grace and mercy and God's love for you. No matter where you stand right now, no matter where you sit right now, God's love for you has not stopped and it will not stop. Sin is any failure to conform to God's law. It could be an act it can be an attitude, it can be the nature within us. It can be done by an individual or by a group. It's not just stealing, lying, committing adultery. It's not just murder, but it's attitude to come with those things. It's, it's the mindset behind those things. And you can sin and never even take an action because God knows the intent of your heart. And God knows what nobody else can see. God can see deep below the layers of your journey, and God can see things nobody else even understands or present. And this is why when people are broken by sin, they will often at some point manifest into this idea of hopelessness. Nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. There is somewhere to turn today. Turn to Jesus Christ. See, pleasing God is living a life that is just bigger than just morals. It's important to be moral, certainly. But pleasing, pleasing God is not just living a pure life. Pleasing God is happening at the desires of one's heart. A lot of behavior we look at today in humanity, we look at outside behavior. We, we look at things on the outside. We think if we can curb this person that way or put this law in place or put this restriction in place, that we can shape behaviors of humans. God changes people at the heart level, not the outside level. We, we tend to want to mitigate and adjust and move people by controlling and by guiding and by putting boundaries, and, and that does have some effect, no doubt. But the reality is this, until you change the heart, you cannot create enough laws to govern a sinful, wicked society. But once you change the heart, the laws become almost secondary. Once you change the compelling of one's passions and one's drives in life, you've just changed everything. When you look at the idea of sin, we begin to realize that God's love for us requires us to love God at the same level that he loves us. And that that attitude and the mindset behind a heart that loves God is driven by the message of the gospel. Mark chapter 12 says we should love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Every part of me needs to love God. Every part of my being, every fiber within me needs to love God because the Bible's clear on this. It's my love for God that keeps me from sinning. It's not the laws, it's not the rules, it's the passions of my heart. And if I don't stop sinning, I keep living in a state of perpetual death and decay. And I realize when you look at Adam and Eve's story that the moment that sin came in, they didn't die immediately, but they began the death process. They began to decay. Earth began to come into place of, of difficulty and destitute decay because that's what sin did to this society, not just the people, but that was around them. Romans chapter 6 says the wage of sin is death, but, everybody say but, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's always another part of the story in the conversation. Death is not just physical, death is spiritual. And death happens upon turning away from hope in Jesus to the sorrow of this life that separates you and I from our creator. Isaiah chapter 59 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short that it cannot save, nor is his ear too dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, our sins, our iniquity, and, and iniquity is a, a deeper layer. It's, it's, it's like an under-the-surface bruise have separated you from your God. And your sins, you have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For his hand, your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. This verse 3 sounds a lot like Facebook today. Difficulty, all present because of sin. But, and here's the good news, there's more to the story. 
like the opening story of a man named Kevin, he, he jumped off the bridge, but he didn't die. This is a powerful thought because the word but in the conversation of sin and brokenness is powerful because when you hear what the Bible says about sin and what it says about judgment, it's hard to process, is there any hope for me? And the answer is there's absolutely hope for you because that's not the whole story. Jesus came in the scene for you and for me today, and but is a very powerful world in a conversation of difficulty. Example, the doctor comes in and says, hey, you've got cancer, but it's treatable. Doctor comes in and says, you got this, but we can fix it. Or you get a phone call from one of your kids and they say, hey, our other son was in a, our other brother was in a car wreck, but he's okay. Or you get a company letter that says we're laying off all the jobs, but yours is fine. That intervening word right there changes everything. We were sinners, but there is hope. We had sin, but we have a savior. We were messed up, but we have a promise. We were dying, but we have eternal life. We had this, but because of God, we now have that opportunity. Jesus is the key to the conversation. Thanks be to God that even though we were destitute for death, even though you and I today, because of the fall of humanity, were born into a sin nature, and because of that, we sin a whole lot easier than we live a righteous life, but thanks be to God that he did not just save us, but gives us grace to walk out the journey every day of our life. Have you ever noticed how it's easier to be bad than it is to be good sometimes? We've been in a drought last couple of weeks here, which I guess is somewhat relative to droughts, but we call it a drought because our front yards aren't very green. I noticed this the other day that in a drought season, the, the good grass doesn't grow but the weeds, do they ever stand tall? And it's almost like they grow greater when the other stuff isn't growing at all. And our lives are much the same. When, when, when the good stuff is hard to take place, when it's hard to have a good attitude, when it's hard to honor God, when it feels difficult to apologize or repent, when it feels like that this Christian life is too much to ask of somebody. Have you noticed that when that gets droughty or dry, that the sin can sure pop up and the weeds can come flying out of nowhere? And that happens all by itself. We need nothing to make us bad. We start off there. And again, this is a real affront for many people, even the idea that, what you mean I need a Savior? What do you mean I'm a sinner? What do you mean? I, I, I pay my bills. I'm not in trouble with the law. I, I, I go to work every day. I go to church Christmas and Easter. I do all the right things. Who are you to call me? My response back is you're looking at a guy who needed a savior. You're looking at a guy who on his own accord, no merit, had nothing to offer to a holy God. And you're looking at a guy who every day lives by the grace and mercy of God covering my life. So I'm not calling you anything. I'm speaking to all of us that we needed a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. Because the world God created, the world God created would never have a young man walk in the bridge crying. Because God's world was hopeful. God's world was joyful. God's world had peace. God's world had family connections without difficulty. What's interesting about Genesis chapter 3 is that the very next chapter, after the fall of man, the very next chapter, we have our first murder. A brother kills a brother. Sin has always come to destroy your life. And anywhere you find hopelessness, sinfulness, and brokenness, Jesus is the only answer. And we have to turn toward him even today. Thanks be to God that even though the bad news was bad and sin was real and that God's judgment 
is true. There is a thing called the judgment at the end of this life. You will stand before a holy God. It's not the end of the story. We're not done yet. Because of Jesus, it's not over. And because of Jesus, the best is yet to come. Because of Jesus, there is hope. Because of Jesus, your past can be washed away and be cleansed. And you might ask, well, how do, how do I do that? How do I come to this hope in Jesus Christ? Because if indeed I'm a sinner, like you say, preacher, if that's really me, and what's the hope? Well, it's real simple. You just believe because God has acted to save sinners like me and like you. And we just got to believe. There's a story in the book of Acts where this jailer was watching over the Paul and Silas, and, and, and there was an earthquake that took place, and they broke out of the jail. They came out to be set free, and the jailer was like, what am I going to do here? They're going to kill me. They said, no, no, don't, don't, don't harm yourself. Believe on Jesus. And they had this dialogue back and forth. He goes, what do I do to be saved? They said, just believe on his name. Anybody who believes, we, we read this early on, anybody, everybody, the gospel's for everybody. The gospel, the good news is for all of us today. And no matter how long you've maybe even been coming to the house of God, maybe today you've been sitting here processing this, maybe for weeks and months, doesn't matter. Today could be the day you finally believe. You heard stories of people who were going to church, living the life, but living another life too at the same time. And our human nature is always bent toward duplicity. We are bent toward the idea of projecting one thing, and living another thing. And some things we can do that well. Other things, because the body reveals, we can't hide. But we can hide sin pretty easy. You might say, well, Marty, this believing thing to me is a bit questionable because, you know, I just don't do blind faith. Well, believing isn't blind faith. Believing is reliance. It's trusting it's biblical faith is trusting and relying. That's what biblical faith is. And I'll be the first to tell you that the moment you choose to believe in Jesus Christ is not the day your questions stop. For me, it's the day my questions start. I begin to learn more and begin to lean in deeper. It's kind of like the idea of a relationship. You learn more after you meet someone than you do before you meet someone. See, trusting in Jesus is just a willful choice. That's all it is. It's not complicated. And it's not even hyper-spiritual. Today, I'm going to just be the first to tell you that when you choose to follow Jesus Christ, you may not have some overwhelming sense of transformation on the inside immediately. But that doesn't mean God didn't show up. For somebody, you may feel that way. That's fine. That we're all unique people. But today, believing is simply a choice of willful reliance upon the life of Jesus, the person of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the return of Jesus. See, salvation is all about Jesus today. And Jesus has made the path for me and for you to come in this very moment. God's only begotten son paid the price for the sin of Marty Sloan. God's only begotten son took all of my sin all of my shame and put it upon his back upon the cross. And on that cross, on a hill called Golgotha, Calvary, the skull, the place of death that they'd killed many people at, on that cross that day, I wasn't there, but all my sins were present. Everything I would ever do was paid for by Jesus that day. And the same is true for you and for me because our only hope in life or in death, is that we are not our own, but we belong to him. You're not by yourself. You're not alone today. Jesus is your savior. If you choose him, God is your creator. Whether you believe it or not, he is your creator. You can't change that. And the tension comes in the idea of, can I then therefore pick my own path in life? The answer is no. God's in charge. He holds all this in your hands. And the difficulty we see, the brokenness we see, the suffering that we see amongst humanity even right now is because we have taken ourselves and placed ourselves in the place only God can place himself. We have taken our place in the seat of authority that only God has a right to. This happened in Genesis chapter 3. It was all good. 
and sin fractured. It was all good and life broke. And from that point on, we've been journeying back to the hope that God had originally planned for his creation for each of us today. Nothing can compare today to the knowledge of knowing that Jesus Christ is your Savior and your hope is in him today and that you have eternal life. Your sins are washed away. Your past is forgiven. And you have the promise that one day he will come for you. Or if you leave this life before that day, you will go to him in a place of security and strength and hope and peace and reside with him. When you think about this, the Bible gives us the way. Jesus said in John 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Nobody. You can't pick your own path to God. God has set forth the plan of salvation. There isn't a way around it. There isn't a way to avoid it. You will stand before a holy God one day. Every one of us here will. Our works in this life will be accounted for that day. We shall all give an account because we are not our own. Let me give it to you in a little sense of just identity for you today. God has the authority just like parents have the authority over a child that they conceive together. They have that authority and they govern that child. And we all understand that it makes sense to us. I know you're thinking, well, then at some point the kid grows up and grows out of that authority. Well, then you move from authority to relationship. And if you've ever been broken by a family relationship fracture, you know the pain of that. In God's ideal path, in God's ideal plan, you're reborn into a family that would be with you, would be the authority for a season. Certainly, and my parents raised me with a, definitely a, uh, an authoritative approach in life, and it helped me certainly. But now that they're not my boss, they're people I honor, and we're in friendship, and we talk. And they're not in charge, and that's okay. But it's not about authority now, it's about honor. It's a different dynamic, and that's how it is with you and God. And so God does have the authority, yes, but at some point, the authority kind of gives away to the idea of honoring. And I don't live a life every day by going to the book and going, hey, can I get to do this? Do I get to do that? Is this get out of jail free card Tuesday? No, I go and say, how can I honor God today? And my heart is not to check the boxes and cross the T's and dot the I's. My heart is to live a life that he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the heart behind the transference from authority to honor your life today. Thank you for watching the Calvary Church YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss a video. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, be sure to text CC New Life to 94000. Someone from our team will reach out to you Say hey and talk a little bit about what that decision means for you. For more information on our church, head to calvarynaperville.org or follow us on social media by clicking the links in the description. Hope to see you in person soon. Have a great day.